Uh, so, Kombanwa, Niha, good Abend, good evening. Um, so I think I've covered the main uh, bases there. Um, I'm Tim O'Shea, I'm the Principal and uh, Vice Chancellor of the University. Uh, tremendous uh, pleasure uh, to welcome you to this inaugural lecture. A uh, particular well, uh, pleasure to welcome the Consul General uh, of Japan uh, here. Um, it is um, a, a real privilege uh, to be introducing uh, Professor Matthias Zachman. Um, he tells me he got interested um, in Japan and Japanese when he was 14. Uh, and he, in obviously a very advanced German school, uh, started studying Japanese as his third language then. Um, he <clears throat> then proceeded uh, to um, Heidelberg, uh, where he got a first degree in Japanese studies with Chinese studies as a secondary subject, and a doctorate, summa cum laude, in, in Japanese. And he got also his habilitation in Japanese uh, studies from the University of uh, München. Um, and he's an incredibly industrious young man. Um, and this has been evident from this early part of his career because in a parallel, <coughs> parallel course of study, um, he graduated from Heidelberg Law School. And after two years of deviling, so very appropriate that we we're on this side of the campus, uh, took uh, the bar exam in the federal state of Hesse, Germ Germany. So we have somebody who is qualified at a very high level in Japanese and Chinese, and also qualified at a very high level in law. And he told me he learned to love law, uh, but returned uh, to the academic life. And that's uh, partly because he was telling me as a teenager, he became addicted uh, to classical Chinese, uh, classical Japanese literature. So, um, but very good for us that he came back um, to the academic life. Uh, we were delighted to recruit him in 2011. Before that, he had positions in Munich and Heidelberg University and visiting appointments at various institutions, including Tokyo University, Harvard, Harvard Waseda, uh, and Skubo. And he was appointed by us uh, to the inaugural ch Hander Chair in Japanese-Chinese relations. Um, his research focuses on the history of international relations in East Asia uh, with a special focus on Japanese-Chinese relations and on the history of political ideas and law in East Asia. So he's uh, <coughs> taken his collective uh, great academic skills in Japanese and Chinese and law and put, put them to together in an extremely productive way. His first book on Japanese-Chinese relations in the late 19th century attracted international acclaim and won a prestigious award in the field of Japanese studies. His second book on international law in Japan in the 20th century has just come out. Uh, with us, he's been instrumental in setting up two successful master's programs, um, the MSc in J Japanese Society and Culture and the MSc in e East Asian Relations. And he's currently a program director of the new, the, the new MSc in East Asian Relations. He has co-founded um, the East Asian Studies Series at Edinburgh University Press and was elected member of Academia Europea in 2013. Um, so he's very much a young, young star professor with hybrid interests. Um, as I said, an, an appointment the university uh, was delighted to make. And it's now a great pleasure to invite him to speak on the meaning of Asia in Japanese-Chinese relations. Thank you very much, Principal, for this very kind and generous introduction and also for the gen very generous support for um, East Asian studies you have extended throughout the years. Um, I realize today that there is a certain advantage of giving the lecture a little while after the appointment, appointment because now I have accumulated enough um, experience um, to credibly and very heartily thank my colleagues um, in Asian studies and also in the school for the kind welcome to Edinburgh Uni University, University and the great collaboration so far. Also, I'm very glad that we have um, such good links with the consulate and with the consulate general of Japan, Japan in Edinburgh. 
the Japan Society of Scotland and um, the Students Japanese Society, and more recently also the cross-party group in Japan, uh, on Japan in Scottish Parliament. So um, I'm very, very honored and greatly appreciate that so many of you, of you have come. And it is my great pleasure now to discuss with you a problem which has troubled me throughout my research so far, namely the meaning of Asia in, Jap in Japanese-Chinese relations. Now to give you a, just one recent example of the problem, um, in, 2000, in August 2009, um, shortly before the DPJ um, was elected and uh, came into power, the leader and soon-to-be Prime Minister Hatoyama Hato Yukio uh, published an article in the New York Times um, and in which he developed his vision of a new path for Japan. He criticized the dehumanizing forces of globalization and um, advocated a return to the spirit of fraternity, as in the French, liberté, égalité, both in domestic politics as well as in international relations. So in international relations, this meant that Japan should reassert its Asian identity and promote the creation of an East Asian community. In his own words, another natural goal Another national goal that emerges from the concept of fraternity is the creation of an East Asian community. Of course, the Japan-US Security Pact will continue to be the cornerstone of Japanese diplomatic policy. But at the same time, we must not forget our identity as a nation located in Asia. I believe that the East Asian region, which is showing increasing vitality, must be recognized as Japan's basic sphere of being. Well, these words seem innocuous enough, and um, the project of a, an East Asian community also very laudable. Had not the current foreign minister of China, Wang Yi, just three years ago before called for a new Asianism, a Xin Yajou Zhui for the 21st century? And was the East Asian region not undisputably the basic sphere of Japan's being? How could Hatoyama's proposal for an East Asian community not elicit great hopes and ease the tension in the region. Unfortunately, and contrary to our expectations, this was not so. Hatoyama repeated during his tenure as prime minister his offer of um, founding an East Asian community several times um, when meeting representatives of China, Korea, and ASEAN nations, but each time he was politely rebuffed or even, even openly criticized, and not only there, but also in Japan, he was criticized and not just by the opposition. But most gallingly, Japan's closest ally, the US, was highly displeased with Hatoyama's Asian affectations and swiftly demanded penance. Barely nine months later, Hatoyama resigned and um, the, East, the East Asian community was just one series, one uh, of a series of well-meant projects which just didn't go to plan. The question here is why Hatoyama's proposal met such poor uh, responses. The problem was not, as many of, of us might think, conditioned by the media today, um, the usual history argument, such as textbook and Yasukuni shrine issues. Even Chinese commentators were so gracious and kind to point out that um, the situation in East Asia has now changed um, fundamentally, and Hatoyama's proposal did not have anything in common with the notorious um, Greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere during the war. But it was not a trivial matter of current strategy either, because all the comments seem to point at a more fundamental unease with an Asian identity of Japan. The underlying question of these comments in Japan China and the US were unequivocally, what does it mean when Japan says Asia? And what is the subtext of the seemingly innocuous word? And what does it imply for Japan's foreign policy, especially in its most central menage a trois with China and the US? This is the question which my lecture addresses today, at the end of which I hope to give you an enlightening, if not necessarily satisfactory an answer. And by the by, I also touch on some related problems such as why does Japan have such problems coming to terms with its Asian past? What does Asia mean for the course of East Asian integration today? And finally, 
what are the implications for us doing Asian studies and for the humanities and social sciences in general today? Of course, one hour is not quite enough to touch the question even, one, to answer one question even um, thoroughly. And so the following will be a somewhat impressionistic lecture. I will limit myself, therefore, to two cases in history, which were arguably the most crucial in Sino-Japanese relations, namely the First Sino-Japanese War and the Second Sino-Japanese War. The shifting meaning of Asia as a concept very clearly reflects the fundamental changes that took place between China and Japan at these times. Now, it is fashionable to begin any discourse on any subject with the statement that something is ambivalent. But when talking about the meaning of Asia and Japanese-Chinese relations, no other word is actually appropriate because Japan's political and cultural position in East Asia itself is ambivalent. It is wedged between China and the West. And what this means, I'm going to demonstrate now. So Chinese historians in recent times have um, the tendency to emphasize the harmonious nature of pre-modern relations in East Asia um, and extol the relative tranquility of the Sinocentric tribute relationship. The assumed purpose of this is to allay fears that China, having finally regained its strength after 150 years of humiliation, would now become, become aggressive. So a tradition of harmony is created which bolsters China's claims to a peaceful rise and lets its good neighborly policy shine forth even more brightly. But from a Japanese perspective, this harmony seems a bit hollow, not because China was especially aggressive during the pre-modern period, on the contrary, but more for the reason that relations between Japan and China rarely have been harmonious ever. They were always fraught with a, with a sense of competition, at least from the Japanese side. The displeasure of the emperor of the Sui dynasty, who received a letter from his Japanese colleague in the year 607 AD, is well known, as the Japanese leader had the temerity to declare himself equally son of heaven, or Tianzi, a, t a title which was reserved for the Chinese emperor only. The official chronicle reports that the Chinese emperor um, ordered that such an impudent letter should never again be brought to his attention. After all, the tribute system only worked on the assumption that China was the cultural and therefore political center, and that Japan, as Eastern barbarian, should submit to its authority. Japan did only so briefly, and otherwise tried to ignore China's political and cultural hegemony. It is for these reasons that only for a short period um, there were diplomatic relations, and for a thousand years between the 9th and the 19th century, there were not really any diplomatic relations worth mentioning. This does not mean that, Ch that Japan was not highly indebted to China as a culture. On the contrary, even during the relatively secluded Tokugawa period, Chinese culture was the culture of the Japanese elite. In fact, one way of looking at Tokugawa intellectual history is to classify how these intellectuals challenged the authority of Chinese or the, uh, the hegemony of Chinese culture, either by internalization through overcompensation or by absolute rejection. So internalization and overcompensation means that um, Japanese intellectuals will say, okay, um, Chinese culture is, is something different from um, China as political body. It is, um, it origins from China, but it has nothing to do necessarily with Ming China or with Qing China. And China is wherever um, its culture is realized more, most perfectly. So Japanese intellectuals, especially Confucianists, could say um, Japan is the new China. We are the real middle kingdom. <coughs> Some intellectuals took the other road and rejected China outright, but these nationalists were in the minority. By and large, the working model was a hybrid one which blended the Japanese spirit with Chinese skills. Well, that's the phrase, the wakon kansai. That's the China, uh, Japanese phrase. But even within this formula, we can observe a tremendous 
inferiority complex and revolt against Chinese superiority on the Japanese side. This was probably exacerbated by the fact that China largely ignored these claims as, um, to superiority as ridiculous and otherwise viewed uh, Japan as a quaint deviation from the original model, namely from China. By transference, this complicated attitude became the standard pattern that governed Japan's encounter with Western culture as well. Um, so it is well known that Japan during the Meiji period um, adopted West, uh, Western models assiduously, assiduously but uh, also very se selectively and changed resolutely from the Chinese standard to the Western standard of civilization. But even then, Japan found itself in a very, in a quite impossible situation. Because it is true, Japan at the time already exerted tremendous cultural influence or attraction on the West. Um, as the Japonisme in France and other countries of Europe, even in Scotland and the, in, in the US showed. But this was traditional soft power and it infuriated um, progressive Japanese who did not want to be considered as a beautiful oriental garden of mountains and waters and of birds and butterflies. Unfortunately, this was exactly what Western travelers to Japan sought. Namely, the Japanese alternative to fin de siècle ennui of the modern world. And they mourned the fading of this old Japan amidst the quaint, but again, quite uh, imperfect deviation from the Western model. The very concrete expression of this imperfection were the so-called unequal treaties, which made sure that whenever a Westerner um, set a foot into, a into Asia, he was never touched by Asia. So Japan, before the first Sino-Japanese war, was very much sandwiched between, in an uncomfortable position between China and the West and their respective condescension. The double inferiority complex, as I call it, very much informed Japan's attitude towards Asia. It should be mentioned that from the very first contact with the West, it was clear to the Japanese that the Western concept of Asia, Asia or Toyo, that is interchangeable, had no parallel in East Asian consciousness itself and therefore was a purely foreign concept. Asia as a concept was first introduced by the Jesuits such as Matteo Ricci and it was through their geographic knowledge that um, it came to Japan in the 17th century. But right from the beginning, the concept met with protest because it uh, signified in a way an imbalance of power between the West and Asia, which expressed itself in the authority of naming geographies and which would have to be reclaimed by Asian countries as soon as possible. So the proto-nationalist scholar Aizawa Seishisai wrote in 1883, the Western barbarians have allocated names to the continents such as Asia, Europe, and Africa. But this allocation of names is an out outrageous abuse because such names have not been approved by the emperor of Japan, nor are these universal names that have been conventionally accepted since antiquity. It's only the Westerners' arrogance that has made them use the term Asia and include our div divine land, that is Japan, as part of it. Now this imbalance of power which expresses itself in the name of Asia is also the background for one of um, the now most iconic texts um, of modern Japan, namely Fukuzawa Yukichi's Datsu Adon. Um, you can trans translate Datsu Adon as leaving Asia be behind their um, altern alternative translations, but it's basically you know, getting rid of Asia. Um, and for accuracy, I, sh I should mention that um, this text was one of many thousands of editorials which appeared at the time. So um, contemporaries did not really notice or did not think it very um, um, conspicuous and it was not much discussed um, just because, and most likely because it was so inconspicuous, it was very commonsensical. Um, there was no need to discuss it. And it became only famous in the 1960s and then since then um, has been made the iconic text for Japan's westernization, drastic and um, swift westernization, but also for Japan's aggressive policy towards China and Korea. I mean, this is not wrong, but it is also a very superficial reading, actually, because um, what um, Fukuzawa 
because westernization is not the problem here. In the 1880s, everybody was already agreed that Japan should westernize, and Fukuzawa had no need to defend westernization towards his contemporaries. So this was not the problem. In fact, what Fukuzawa tackled in this text was the much more fundamental problem of perception, and what today is often subsumed under the blanket concept of soft power. So in Datsu Aron, Fukuzawa argued that although Japan, Japan was already well on its course of modernization, the Western powers still did not differentiate between China, Korea, and Japan. They viewed all of them as one, um, part, as, as, as one region, as part of Asia, that is, as a backward culture, primitive, irrational, cruel, superstitious, tyrannical, and what have you. It is difficult to say whether Fukuzawa actually believed in what he wrote, um, in these attributes he wrote about China and Korea. Um, but they were images um, which he did not, of course, invent, but um, borrowed from um, 19th century Orientalist discourse with which we are so fam familiar today. The same attributes applied all over the world to any non-Western or colonial countries, be they Turkey, India, Egypt, or for that matter, Ireland. So if, if Fukuzawa called upon Japan to dissociate itself from Asia, he really meant to dissociate from the Orientalist attitude of Western powers. And this is what Japan should get rid of. Asia in the 1880s, therefore, <clears throat> was a cipher for Western discourse and was ultimately directed against Western supremacy. In the same way as Aizawa Seishisai contested the Western authority to classify and thereby subordinate the world. But of course, <clears throat> although the concept of leaving Asia was ultimately directed against the West, the countries which suffered first from this policy were China and Korea. After all, what creates soft power more effectively than a dashing display of hard power? In 1885, Fukuzawa ended his Datsu Aron with the ominous words, which you can read on the slide. Even when dealing with China and Korea, we need, to have, uh, we not, we, we need not have spe uh, special scruples, simple, simply because they are our neighbors, but should behave towards them as Westerners do. Well, at the same time, Fukuzawa wrote these lines, France was fighting with China a war about supremacy in Vietnam. So every contemporary who read this um, readily understood that Fukuzawa really meant that Japan should fight a war with China to demonstrate that Japan had dissociated itself from Asia. And when the war between China and Japan actually broke out in 1894, it is no surprise that in the Japanese media and propaganda, it was consciously staged as a war between civilization and barbarism. So that is the, uh, another title of, um, of an ed editorial by Fukuzawa Yukichi in August 1894. Now we could adduce a number of striking sources for this, but no other illustrates this better than, <coughs> and more effectively than the so-called Nishiki, the woodblock prints um, which depict heroic scenes from the battlefield, such as this one, and which were highly popular in Japan at the time. So they were really bestsellers. Um, to <clears throat> and on these prints, you can literally see Japan driving out its Asian demons in the form of Chinese soldiers. So you, you always see these uh, Japanese soldiers um, in this French-style uniform, very modern, and uh, the Chinese enemy is always clad in these clown-like costumes, and um, the Japanese soldiers are fiercely going at, at it. So um, they are very pretty, but also very evil designs in that way. Japan's challenge of Western perception was successful, and the Western powers agreed to renegotiate the unequal treaties starting in 1894. But little did Japanese leaders foresee that Japan's unexpected victory would transform not only the image of Japan, but also of Asia itself, and transform it in the eyes of the Western powers from a pretty, beautiful oriental garden into a fiery dragon. It is no coincidence 
that racialized fears of the yellow peril raised its head in the same year as Japan defeated China. Well, this is one of the more lurid expressions of this fear. Um, it is a painting which was commissioned by the German Emperor Wilhelm II in 1895 and of which many, cop uh, many copies circulated throughout, throughout the world. So this is, uh, actually this is a, um, a, an, a lithographic reprint in a Japanese newspaper in um, January 1896. So you can see that uh, news traveled very fast actually. In this painting, you can see the nations of Europe under unified or united under the Christian cross to, to defend their holiest goods. Actually, that is the superscription of the painting which says, says um, ye nations of Europe defend your holiest goods. And then you never know what these are, but anyway. Um, defend these holiest goods against the threat coming from the east. It is difficult to see on this illustration, but the threat is symbolized by a golden Buddha riding a fiery dragon. The Buddha is clearly meant to be Japan, and the dragon is China. So you see that um, in the east, or coming from the east, so on the right, right hand side. So um, what Western powers feared most was a strategic alliance between Japan and China that would combine Japanese modernization and Chinese resources and manpower. Now it should be added that this was not a purely German fear and that racialized anxieties were widespread in Europe. Just to give you another example, no other than the propagator of social Darwinism, Herbert Spencer, advised the Japanese government on the proper course of political and social development and modernization. This was in the, in the early 1890s. But actually he was quite irritated that the Japanese government wouldn't heed his advice because his, um, he argued for a very slow and a very gradual modernization considering the backwardness of Japan. And what the Japanese government did was uh, making quantum leaps to uh, pursue, the, uh, the, uh, pursue Europe and uh, probably catch up with it. So um, to keep at least one barrier intact, Spencer therefore demanded that Japan should prohibit miscegenation, that is marriage with foreigners. He argued the consequence is that if you mix the constitutions of two, uh, two widely divergent varieties which have severally become adapted to widely divergent modes of life, you get a constitution which is adapted to the mode of life of neither, so not fit to survive, basically. You see, therefore, that my advice is strongly conservative in all directions, and I end by saying as I began, keep other races at arm's length as much as possible. So since civilization did not prove a barrier high enough to separate Europe from Asia, race would have to do the thing. This conviction was reconfirmed by the rejection of the racial equality clause um, for the covenant of the League of Nations in 1919, as many of you know. So the concept of Asia was quite a dangerous one for Japan to be associated with. And the Japanese avoided it at all costs in the eyes of the Western powers. At the same time, this did not prevent individual Japanese to use Asia in a way that already prefigured later strategies, namely to co-opt East Asian neighbors, but also to justify Japan's hegemony in East Asia in the face of Western imperialism. We can observe this dual strategy of pan-Asianism, as, as it is called, already in the manifesto of Japan's most influential pan-Asianist society, the East Asian Common Culture Society, the Toa Dobun Kai. In 1898, the manifesto stated, emotionally, we are as close as brothers. Strategically, we are as near to each other as the lips and teeth. But who would have thought that in recent years, heaven would show no compassion and that brothers would be fighting each other? I think that is a um, quotation for, from the Shijing. But in any case, the European powers have exploited the discourse discord and the situation is becoming more and more difficult every day. Now, the similes of lips and teeth or wheels and spokes are stock rhetorical devices of pan-Asianism as well as the phrase of same culture, same race, dobun doshu, which gave the society its name. 
Uh, that's Tong Wen Tong Tong in Chinese. But what is most interesting here is the image of China and Japan as brothers. That is the invocation of brotherly love or fraternity because we know that the text was most probably drafted by an influential, influential intellectual at the time um, called Kuga Katsunan, who was a most prominent advocate of a strong foreign policy. And one of the first who came up with the idea of an East Asian Monroe Doctrine. Um, we have to re remind ourselves in 1898, this was the year that the Western powers started their so-called scra scramble for concessions on China, um, which carved up China into spheres of influence. And Kuga Katsunan and other Japanese furiously attacked the Western powers for their imperialist policy and fashioned Japan as the, cha as the champion of Chinese integrity. Kuga accused the Western powers of betraying the ideals of, uh, on which Europe had come into existence. What Europe has become today, does it origin from the brute force within man, or does it not rather come from the ideals of justice, freedom, and brotherhood? The diplomats who despise justice, freedom, and brotherhood as empty words, those who justify the principle of the survival of the fittest in politics, do they still want to tell me that this is civilized diplomacy? So this, um, this um, Justice, freedom, and brotherhood is quite interesting because, of course, it is, again, an allusion to um, liberté, égalité, fraternité. It's just that um, égalité is switched with um, justice, segi, and I'm not quite sure what this, what this means in the context, but, or one could guess. But in any case, <clears throat> Kuga, in the following, stylized J Japan as the truly civilized country which upheld these virtues, and... Um, which defended China against the um, Western powers and shielded China from, its inc uh, from the incursions. And this was the same year that the US fought and defeated Spain over Cuba. It is therefore no coincidence that Kuga clad his arguments in terms of an Asian Monroe Doctrine and bluntly claimed Japan's hegemony in East Asia, as you can see in this quote, um, so Kuga claimed that Japan should be master shudin of East Asia. Or as Kuga's mentor, Konoe Atsumaru, succinctly, if somewhat tautologically phrased it, Asia is the Asia of Asians. Toyo wa Toyoji no Toyo nari. So whereas um, Asia previously had been something evil for Japan or a threat for the West, it now became a cipher for Japan's new imperial status and exclusive sphere of interest. But the invention of this new meaning comes with two caveats. First, because of the suspicions of the Western powers and Japan's relative weakness, the Japanese leadership had to tread ever so lightly with pan-Asianist sentiments and claims to an exclusive sphere, lest the Western powers would gang up against Japan. Konoe Atsumaro had to experience this very drastically when he publicly floated the idea of a same-race alliance, a dojin shudome, of um, Asian nations against the Western powers. Konoe probably never imagined that his proposal, which he published in a, well, it was fairly well-read um, Japanese journal, but nonetheless, that it would be read outside of Japan, but so it was, it was, it, it literally went around the world in every little newspaper, it was reprinted um, in, 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 in German, in English, in French, wherever you go. Um, and if talk about the yellow peril had not been damaging enough, the proposal created such an outcry in the capitals of Europe, so much so that the Japanese ambassador finally in France had to step up and make a statement that Konoe Atsumaro, um, well, you know, is a buffoon, uh, an ultra-nationalist who, who is not to be taken, to be taken seriously and he doesn't represent uh, the opinions of the Japanese government anyway. Well, considering that Konoe had been the emperor's closest protégé and was groomed to become prime minister um, in Japan in the near future, one, con one can call this but desperate measures. But it also very clearly demonstrates that a rapprochement between China and Japan was so much harder due to this suspicion of the Western powers.
Not that China was ready to be reconciled either. This is the second caveat. After all, what Japan's mission as master of East Asia effectively meant for China was to become another object of Japan's mission civilisatrice. And this, this with a good dose of black pedagogy. The first Sino-Japanese war was thus reinterpreted as a kind of shock therapy to um, wake up China from, from its oriental slumber. And the Boxer expedition in 1900 was another friendly clap on the fingers. It is therefore no surprise that Chinese um, usually did not buy into, the, uh, into, the, into these professions of justice, freedom, and brotherhood and kept their distance. Now, Jacques Derrida once observed that French revolutionaries always seemed a bit embarrassed about the brotherhood part of liberté, égalité, fraternité, because they may have sensed somehow that nowhere is the fighting so bitter than amongst brothers. This certainly applies in Japanese-Chinese relations in the Meiji period. It is because of the dangerous notions of Asia that Japan kept a low profile on it in the next decades. So Japan co-founded the League of Nations in 1919 and participated in all major treaties that symbolized the liberal internationalist, internationalist politics of the 1920s. But there was one part of Asia, one piece, which was accepted from this liberalism, and this was Manchuria. Japan signed all of the abo above agreements with the more or less explicit reservations that this would not touch upon Japan's special interests in Manchuria. But we should uh, know that this was nothing particular because um, Britain did the same. Um, for, so for example, it made exceptions to the um, Kellogg-Briand Pact of 1928 and, say, uh, and said, well, um, this is a nice treaty, um, but it does not affect our interests in certain regions by which he meant, um, by which uh, Britain meant, sorry, Egypt and Persia, and so these were off limits for other countries. But for Japan, Manchuria would soon become the catalyst for the remarkable reinterpretation of the meaning of, East A of Asia. As it is well known, in 1931, amidst the general turmoil of global economy and politics, Japan occupied Manchuria and hence pursued a path of increasing confrontation with Kuomintang China. No other concept illustrates this break with its previous policy better than the re-evaluation of the concept of Asia during the next 15 years. So in three pan-Asianist de declarations, the Japanese government revised its former anti-Asian policy, reinforced its claim of an exclusive Asian sphere of interest to the point of stylizing its war as a liberation war against the Western imperial powers on behalf of the colonized peoples of Asia. Finally, in a third, a new development, it charged the meaning of Asia with the utopian vision of an autonomous commonwealth of Asian nations bound by the spirit of mutual assistance and cooperation and led by Japan as primus inter pares. These declarations were the new order in East Asia, the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere, and the joint declaration of the Greater East Asia Conference. Um, if we want to get a feeling for the highfalutin rhetorics of this, these concepts, we have only to listen um, to the words of Foreign Min Minister Tani Masayuki, who um, in 1942 explained in a radio address the war aims as follows, well, um, obviously to um, free Greater East Asia from the yoke of America and Britain and to contribute to the peace of the world by constructing an order in East Asia and so on and so forth. It's not very original, um, but these were illustrated also by the five principles of coexistence and co-prosperity sphere um, in the joint declaration. And these were, again, very high ideals, namely mutual cooperation, the fraternity of nations, respect of each other's traditions, close economic cooperation, and cultivations of friendly relations with countries outside East Asia. Now, it goes without saying that these lofty declarations were completely dissociated from reality. In the, in the theaters of war and um, 
the horrendous carnage that took place between soldiers and among the civilian population all over Asia and the Pacific. But if we look closely at what Asia in these declarations really meant or tried to achieve, we can understand that there was a certain logic to this dissociation. Now, it has been often argued that these pan-Asianist declarations were an expression of Japan's military aggression on the continent. And there is no doubt that on the surface layer, the concept of a liberated Asia acted as a means of justification for Japan's warfare. But at the same time, these declarations were not only an expression of powerful aggression, but also of weakness of a perpetrator desperately looking for a way out. It is well known that Japan's course into the Asia-Pacific War was less due to a master plan for Asian domination, but a rather graceless and pathetic slide from one crisis to another, and the inability to take decisive action to stop the military juggernaut. The new order in East Asia then was an attempt to co-opt the Chinese Guomindang into a more conciliatory stance and somehow find a solution for the Second Sino-Japanese War when it had become completely stalled and stuck in 1938, and it, when it became an unsustainable drain for Japan. Likewise, the Greater East Asia Conference, well, this is a famous photo of this conference, was the last attempt of the Japanese Foreign Ministry under Shigemitsu Mamoru to ease the war burden on Japan by securing the further cooperation of the participating states, namely Thailand, Manjokuo, Wang Jingwei, China, Burma, and the Philippines. By 1942, the war tide had turned against Japan, and confronted with a rollback by the US and its allies, the foreign minister tried to ease some of the tension by acknowledging um, the nominal independence of these participating countries and granting them more rights than an otherwise more powerful Japan would have done. So Asia in these declarations um, is in fact not a utopian vision of power, but a plea for cooperation from a weak and overextended empire which was soon about to, be co about to collapse. Also, on a second layer, these Asian declarations had nothing to do with Asia at all. After all, these declarations were mostly issued by the civil part of a regime which was dominate, dominated mostly by the military and supported by a highly nationalized population. Also, the government as well as the military were fractured and split into antagonistic elements, so much so that the seemingly irrational indecisiveness and mixed messages of Japan's foreign policy can be attributed to the fact that there was no coherent policy decision pro uh, process in place at the time. Reading the declarations, one often wonders whether they were really intended to con convince the Asian neighbors and were not primarily directed um, towards the domestic audience to co-opt antagonistic groups within Japan. And in fact, we do know that Prime Minister Konue Fumimaro um, explained or intended his, dec his declaration of a new order in East Asia um, to co-opt the military factions in Japan. So he explained in 1938 to one of his aides that the military acted too independently from the government and that he issued the declaration to fix this. Eventually, I cleared my cabinet of its reputation for fence-sitting by taking responsibility for the enlargement of the China incident, meaning the Sino-Japanese war. I tried to restrain the military by an appeal to public opinion. Um, so the great East Asian declarations of Japan were also intended to overcome the fractured state of Asia within Japan. But the appeal, of course, failed. First of all, because the public opinion arguably supported the explanation, and secondly, because the military didn't want to be co-opted. The military used the idea of Greater East Asia to cynically justify its expansion, but otherwise resisted co-optation by arguing that the idea of a Greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere or of a um, new, new order in East Asia was too, too diffuse any, anyway, and um, 
really this should um, be clarified in the future and we really don't know what it is about, which was um, a polite way of saying that even they did not buy into it. They resisted further concretization, moreover, exactly because of it, because they did not want to acknowledge Japan's weakness and despised the cosmopolitan spirit of the joint declaration. The co-prosperity sphere for them was far too close for comfort to the hateful spirit of Geneva and the League of Nations. So for the military, there was nothing Asian about the greater East Asia co-prosperity co sphere. This observation, in fact, was quite acute. If we, if we look at the third layer of Asia in the construction of the co-prosperity sphere, namely its ideological foundation, um, we can see that there is something underneath which is quite unexpected. Well, reading the declarations, one might think, um, okay, this is you know, um, a nice vision of an essentialized, um, harmonious um, East Asia um, based on um, a non-Western unity of culture, history, and race, um, and therefore would be exclusionary of any Western ideology or concepts. But if we look more closely, the opposite is the case, and the Asian part becomes mere eye candy or sugar coating of a substantially Western framework. In my second book, I have looked at the way um, Japanese international lawyers constructed the framework of the co-prosperity sphere. They did so at the request of, Jap of the Japanese foreign ministry, and the hybrid construction they came up with contained a number of surprising elements which had nothing to do with Asia at all. The first element was, of course, the Monroe Doctrine as applied to Asia. The second was the Atlantic Charter of 1941 with, with, with which the project of the co-prosperity sphere had to con compete with. The influence of the Atlantic Charter on Pan-Asianist Declaration is most clearly seen in the five principles of the Joint Declaration, such as mutual cooperation, fraternity, respect of traditions and sovereignty, and so forth. The third influence is Nazi theories of international law, especially Karl Schmitt's concept of large spaces or Großräume. And the fourth element, and this is, the far, this is the most surprising, is the influence of Soviet theories on international law, especially Yevgeny Korovin's idea of an international law in the transitional phase. Well, this is the title of his book, uh, which came out in 1924 and was translated into Japanese in 1933. So exactly in the period in, 19, in the 1930s when you would think that such books uh, would be banished. And the recourse to um, Soviet theories is um, all the more surprising as the official pan-Asianist propaganda was decidedly anti-communist and gave the containment of communism as one reason for the necessity of Asian alliances. But many Japanese intellectuals at the time were crypto-Marxists, um, and so they had strong Marxist leanings, and it is therefore not surprising that some of their ideas turned up in, or, uh, in, in official policy. So we can see that the theoretical framework of Japan's Asianism had hardly anything to do with the essentialist Asia of same race, same culture, which it pretended to in the surface. With a somewhat subversive construction of Asia, Japanese international lawyers pursued actually the same agenda as um, Konoe Fumimaro did, namely to contain, to maintain the legal status quo, to contain ultranationalist forces by some sort of moderation, but, but by some legal framework, um, but um, equally they were doomed to fail. The military and the ultranationalist forces just didn't want to be contained. And um, in any case, um, they started in late 1944 already to prepare for um, Japan's defeat and for another um, post-war order because um, many among the Japanese elite already knew in late 1944 that the war would be over soon or would be over. And it's quite tragic to see that and to see that all the while People still died in the trenches, in the camps, and in the, in the cities, and for one more year. 
So when defeat was declared in August 1945, the civil elite was therefore well prepared for a smooth transition, transition, and the concept of Asia witnessed yet another reinterpretation. It is well known that the personal continuity in high offices in Japan during the war and after the war was exceptionally high. So, for example, Shigemitsu Mamoru, the foreign minister who had convened the Greater East Asia Conference in 1943, later also became the foreign minister who presented Japan as a new member to the United Nations. Similarly, Japan's wartime minister of commerce and industry, Kishi Nobusuke, later became the prime minister who in 1960 um, led Japan into the military alliance with the US that is still intact and will be will remain the cornerstone of Japan's foreign policy in the foreseeable future. The international lawyers too, um, they remained, most of them in their positions, only one of them was, um, was forced to resign, but otherwise all of them became quite uh, famous and influential people in post-war Japan. Moreover, they, they managed the intellectual transition into the post-war order also with remarkable adroitness. If regional autonomy had been their ideal during the war, now that Japan was downsized to its original territories, sovereignty and neutrality were their new ideals. Thus, they, opened the US, they opposed the US-Japan alliance in 1960 because they wanted neutrality. But considering the necessities of the Cold War, um, they soon um, acquiesced to this new arrangement. As we know, Japan immensely profited from this new arrangement, from the reverse course, and starting with the Korean War, began its economic recovery and second career as economic superpower in East Asia. Not everyone was happy, though, about this easy transition and criticized um, the forgetfulness and superficiality of it all. So the Sinologue Takeuchi Yoshimi in 1948 compared Japan's opportunism unfavorably with China's resistance and complained about Japan. If in Japan the idea does not match with reality, we just discard the idea and look for another. A series of errors, but it never happens that the failure ends in failure itself. Failure is always the mother of another success. We do not count the years after the death of one child. We say, let's just make another one. Eventually, we have to ask ourselves, what is the use of prosecuting war criminals after one has lost the war? For Japanese ideology, failure does not exist. In Japan, we constantly fail, and every time we succeed. It is a never-ending repetition. So, in the meaning of Asia, Japan also had come full circle, again, a repetition. Under the conditions of the Cold War, Asia now largely signified communist China, and the developing countries in Asia. And the US, Japan security alliances and economic high, gro high growth guaranteed that Japan was firmly placed in opposition to East Asia. For the next decades, Japan was leaving Asia again. The story having come full circle, we may now return in our conclusion to the general question, what is the meaning of Asia in Japanese-Chinese relations? To answer in a Gertrude Stein fashion, Rose is a Rose fashion, we could, we could say Asia is the West, is China, is Japan, is China again. Or to be more precise, the meaning of Asia is ambivalent and fluctuates with the political ex exigencies of Japan's foreign policy in East Asia. It rarely means what it says on the surface, namely the indefinite geographic region that Europe once chose to call Asia but it usually hides a number of political intentions. So Asia can stand as a cipher to, to challenge Europe's discursive and political power in East Asia. It can signify a state of weakness and backwardness Japan wants to leave behind. It can define the exclusive sphere of special interests of Japan in East Asia, or the object of Japan's civilizing mission, namely China and Korea. It is the threat that an alliance of Asian races could pose for Western powers and the internal suspicion that made a Japanese-Chinese alliance impossible. It is the justification for Japan's expansion on the continent 
and the cause of horrendous suffering this brought to all nations involved. It is the plea for cooperation by an overextended and near defeated empire. It is the doomed idea to contain ultranationalist forces in Japan itself. And finally, again, it is the base of operation which defeated Japan wanted to leave behind in the Cold War era. So the meanings are quite varied and often antagonistic, but they all have one thing in common. In all cases, Asia is a subtractive or divisive concept. Asia either formulates a hidden demand, so it wants something, it wants cooperation, it wants acquiescence, it wants um, solidarity, um, what have you, or it tries to exclude a third party. So it always takes away something. It is therefore no small wonder that Hatoyama's proposal of an East Asian community based on the spirit of brotherhood elicited only cool responses. Given the above variance of meaning, the Chinese side and parts of the Japanese public could well suspect that Hatoyama's pledge to Asia in reality intended to contain China through demands of solidarity and at the same time was an acknowledgement of Japan's relative weakness. The US and other parts of the Japanese public could very well be concerned about the exclusion of the US and the undermining of Japan's most important strategic partnership since the post-war period. Moreover, the proposal of an all-Asian alliance and the invocation of an Asian identity of Japan were bound to be understood as anti-American, as previous examples illustrated. It is therefore no surprise that current Japanese foreign politics handle the concept of Asia with extreme delicacy and try to water it down as much as possible. The push for more open, integrative trans-Pacific partnerships must be under understood from this perspective. Finally, in a last turn of inquiry, if Asia is such a subtractive and divisive concept, what does this mean for us, not only in Asian studies, but for the humanities and social sciences in general? How should we engage in our research um, and teaching with the areas that fall under Asia? Obviously, given my experience, I'm no, I, I do not greatly sympathize with the continuation of Asia as a polemical turn um, be it the project of reclaiming Asia from the West or to provincialize Europe. Either one of these or any similar project that presupposes an essentialized Asia or Europe as its counterpart are doomed to end in a very unproductive back and forth of accusations and self mythologies that ultimately just preserve the status quo and are quite frankly boring. Nor do I fully agree with its opposite of a wholly de-essentialized notion of an Asia that is merely the site of circulation and interaction and questions pure identity in the recognition of multiple connections and interdependence, as Prasenji Dwara would have it. Such a definition is completely procedural and disembodied and would apply to the circulation of Buddhism in pre-modern Asia in the same way as it would apply to cocaine traffic in Mexico City. In the end, to find a more substantial meaning in the study of Asia, we have to ask ourselves why we started out in our research in the first place and why we kept at it so long. Obviously, it was a continuing fascination with particular aspects in the culture or history that speaks to us and is meaningful to us, be it Japanese literature, Indian religion, Confucianist or Buddhist philosophy, Chinese print and press culture, or modern East Asian relations. It is meaningful to us because, as Feng Chia once put it, it is the irreducible inscription of the universal in the singular. Thus, the future of Asian studies then is to read and translate this inscription and make it accessible to outside disciplines and the public so that eventually the notion of Asia dissolves into universal knowledge and wisdom for all. Thank you very much. So, great pleasure uh, to propose a vote of thanks. Um, wonderful to have such a large audience, such a distinguished audience. I'm very pleased the Consul General of Japan is here, very pleased that Lord Bruce is here, uh, Vice Principal Bruard, and the Director of our wonderful Institute.
but very, uh, and um, Francis Ackman took a very, very big topic, um, the, the, the meaning of Asia in this contested space. He used examples from the two Sino-Japanese wars. He used uh, very nice uh, quotations uh, and uh, in terms of revealing the complexity um, and uh, giving us some sense of the historical narrative. Um, that was very, very good. Uh, when I'm asked about uh, the purposes of a university, my standard answer is that the top purpose, and this is where I sound like a contestant in Miss USA uh, competition, I always say the top purpose of a university is uh, to promote world peace, uh, to promote uh, mutual understanding. Uh, I get pushed at the moment, sp you know, speak clearly about Scottish independence. Uh, and uh, the one thing I know is that for the university, as the university, to speak clearly about Scottish independence would be catastrophic in terms of it would be divisive, it would not promote greater understanding. And I think um, in, his, in his lecture and in his answers, the enterprise of, which I consider to be vitally important, of improving the mutual understanding between Japan and China has to be dealt with by an extremely nuanced way, uh, where Matthias gets, you know, says you must look at all, as he did in his answers just now, we look at all perspectives. Um, so a very uh, rewarding lecture uh, uh, for an enterprise which is of fundamental importance. So please join me in applauding Matthias. This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.